crash from wind. This is part of the exam syllabus for the Glider Pilots license. And we're going to cover today pressure, pressure and wind, and we're going to give you some extra help just understanding gradient winds and the Coriolis effect. By the end of this session, I'm hoping that you'll be able to uh, explain a pressure gradient the Coriolis force and friction and how that affects wind. By the end, you should also be able to predict, predict the wind patterns that, uh, and likely weather based on an isobar map or synoptic chart. So here is a synoptic chart uh, showing areas of high pressure, low pressure. You've got lines on here, the blue ones showing cold fronts, the red ones showing warm fronts. We're not going to dwell on those today, but we will be interested in the isobars. This is typically how you will get the chart presented to you in the Aeronautical Information Service. And this is how you might get the information presented to you on some of the other clever graphical systems which are available. Uh, now, including RAF and Meteo and so on. So pressure, how is it measured? Well, we have a standard value, uh, which is often used. And we also measure pressure in a number of different ways, which can be annoying and can also be confusing. So pressure can be measured as pounds per square inch, so PSI, and the standard pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch. It can be measured as millimetres of mercury, or tor, or pascals, or millibars. Millibars for us is very important. So 1013 decimal 25 millibars is the international standard atmospheric pressure. Uh, which is what we use to measure uh, aircraft performance. For instance, uh, flight levels come directly from that. Altimeter setting procedures rely on it heavily. So it's a number that you're going to need to remember. We can measure it simply in atmospheres or inches of mercury. And the Americans, for instance, with their altimeters, use inches of mercury. So 29.92 inches of mercury is the same as 1013.25 hectopascals. Now moving on to wind, you can imagine if we have an area of high pressure and an area of low pressure, air will want to move from the high towards the low pressure, just to balance itself out. We can also determine from that, if we could simply measure the distance, what the pressure gradient is, what the difference in pressure per unit of distance is. So high pressure uh, on the left, distance, low pressure on the right, if you subtract the two figures from each other, and divide it by the distance, we end up with a pressure gradient. Isobars on a chart are shown uh, as lines uh, and they represent points on the Earth's surface uh, that join or align their lines that join points of equal atmospheric pressure. They can be compared to the contour lines on a, on a map. A contour line is a line of equal elevation. The more closely spaced they are, the steeper the gradient. So if you look at this diagram, on the left hand side, the contour lines are tightly packed together. Uh, that's telling us that the slope of the hill is steep there. 
which of course it is. And if you look on the right hand slope, you can see that's a shallower slope and the contour lines are separated out further. There's a wider spacing in between them, which tells you that the slope is shallower. If we take a, a diagram like this, you can see I've drawn a line through between A and B on the contour map and we can transpose that information from the line into 3D or 2D uh, so we can look at a side elevation of it and you can see going from A to B we go up towards a peak and, and then we go back down again until we start rising to the second peak at the second peak we then uh, go down a relatively steep bit followed by a shallower part until we get back down to b again on this diagram here might be easier to see going from a to b rising up from a to the point where it says 115 from 115 it then descends and we can work it out so it's below 60 on that saddle perhaps but but higher than 40 so let's guess at 50. it then rises back up on our route b until we get to a point uh, mark 132 132 and that's the second peak which is clearly higher than the first one and then we go back down the slope towards b again so now we've got a very good idea of what we're confronted with when we're walking on that hill now equally charts on uh, uh, synoptic charts show us isobar so line is joining points of equal pressure um, and they are translated back to pressure at sea level because the problem we have as you can hope I can hope you can see here is that when measurements are taken of air pressure and then translated onto the chart for us at station A in our example the left hand one it's very close to sea level at station B the station is a thousand meters up so 3,000 feet roughly up and so when we measure the pressure there there are two effects and one is because we're higher and the pressure is lower and the other is because the pressure might be different anyway um, and then when we get to station C it's higher still so it's 1800 meters um, and we need to do something about correcting uh, for the for the elevation of the station so what is done is a calculation a correction put in so that the chart that you look at is all brought back down to mean sea level here's a, another example showing just how that is done so your synoptic chart is adjusted to take the isobars back down to mean sea level msl So lines, uh, ice bars are lines joining uh, points of equal pressure and they are adjusted to sea level. And you can see here now on the chart, I've marked two areas. Uh, the blue arrow is pointing at a, a, a low pressure area and it's marked L and 991 hectopascals. So that's the, a valley, if you like, on our contour chart. The red arrow is pointing to a, a high, which is, uh, has the highest pressure there at 1032 millibars. What I'd like you to do, and, just, and I'll give you a, a moment or two to look at it, is now look at this chart and determine whether where the biggest pressure gradient is so where the steepest slope is 
Is it A, is it B, or is it C? Just give you a moment or two to deal with that. It is in fact A, so if you got that right, well done. It has the greatest pressure gradient because the isobars are closest together there. So it has the biggest change in pressure over distance. So now let's look again and we go to A this time. And given we have uh, high pressures and low pressures, and we know that air would want to flow from a high to a low to balance itself out, which way would you expect the air to flow at A? And I'll give you a moment or two to look at that. Well, the arrow marks it there. We would expect uh, the air to want to flow from the high pressure to the low pressure, so very roughly in a southwesterly direction on that chart. So the, when the isobars are uh, close together, we can expect the strongest winds. And where the isobars are spaced out more widely, we can expect lighter or slower winds. And wind, after all, is just moving air. So we'll take a closer look at pressure gradients now, just for a minute. And an example here. The distance between London and Bristol is 172 kilometres, or by my measure anyway. The pressure drop from London to Bristol on this synoptic chart is 4 millibars. Now, if we do the mass, that means that 0 0.023 millibars per kilometre is the pressure gradient. So that's the uh, difference in pressure divided by the distance. Looking again at this one, and you don't need to remember these figures at all, but just illustrating the point. If we look at Ireland on this synoptic chart, we can see that um, the distance between the two is 486 kilometers by my measurement, and the pressure difference on this synoptic chart is 12 millibars. Pretty windy, and you can see off to the northwest there is an area of low pressure with very tightly packed isobar, so quite seriously windy. If we look at the distance between London and Paris, which is 344 kilometers, uh, we can see a pressure difference of just four millibars, and the pressure gradient is 0.012 millibars per kilometre. And a point I want to make here is that all of these are relatively small numbers. So fairly windy at 0 0.025 and very light at 0 0.012. And if we look at hurricanes, for instance, and, very, and uh, they have pressure gradients of the order of 0 0.08 millibars per, per kilometre. So deceptively small numbers. However, at 0 0.08, these winds are strong enough to uproot trees, take roofs off and kill people. So now I'll give you a conundrum. The shard in London is 310 metres tall. And the pressure difference between the base and the top is 39 millibars. And that makes the pressure gradient 125 millibars per kilometer. If a hurricane force wind has a pressure gradient of 0 0.08, 125 is pretty seriously big. So my question is, why on earth don't we get sucked up into outer space by these enormous pressure gradients? Well, the answer is gravity. So 
in the vertical, pressure gradients are balanced off uh, with um, uh, what is called the hydrostatic balance by gravity. So gravity is opposing the pressure, pressure gradient force um, and brings the values back down to something a bit more sensible. So sticking with pressure gradients uh, in the uh, vertical and horizontal, imagine two columns of air. One is cool and the other is warm. Both columns have the same amount of air in them. And in consequence, the pressure at the bottom of each column is the same at 1,000 millibars. So you can go to the cool column, stand there, measure the pressure, it's 1,000 millibars. Go to the warm column, stand there, measure the pressure, it's 1,000 millibars. But the pressure lapse rate between the top and the bottom is different on, in each case. So when we get to the 500 millibar level in our cool column, we're only part of the way up the column on the right, the warm column. And in the warm column, at that point, the pressure is actually higher than it is in the cold column. So now we have a pressure gradient, a difference in pressure between that level in the warm column and that level in the cold column. And if we translate that back to how we look at air around the Earth, you can imagine the warm column somewhere near the equator. Makes sense. The equator is warm, that area is warm, the air is warmed as well. And the cool column is somewhere at the pole. Now we have a pressure gradient between, at, at height, between the level at the same level at the equator as at the pole. So, so at any level, there's a pressure gradient. And this pressure gradient gets stronger as we go up. So air will naturally want to flow at height. It will want to flow from the high pressure, the equator, towards the pole. A natural cycle and you can look at it like in this diagram where the where that particular pressure area is sloped as you move from the tropical areas to the polar areas and in this diagram we've taken 30 degrees north and 80 degrees north that neatly covers where we are at roughly 50 degrees north and you can see that at the surface in this model, the pressure is the same uh, in both the warm and the cool areas. But as we go up through the atmosphere, there's a growing difference in between the pressure at any one level at the equator and at the pole. And that steadily increasing pressure is why we get upper winds moving um, sometimes quite strongly and it can account for uh, things like the jet stream. Uh, this is a major factor in determining this, the jet stream uh, and, um, and why the winds might actually be quite slack and light down, lower down, but upper winds being particularly strong. So wind strengthening because of the pressure gradient at height. So now, probably getting into the meat of it, winds are influenced by um, a couple of things. First, the pressure gradient. The greater the pressure gradient, the stronger the wind. And also the Coriolis force. And the Coriolis force is an, a, a, what's called an apparent force and it's caused by the Earth's rotation. And that changes the direction of objects moving across the surface. The strength of this Coriolis force is dependent on the wind. The Coriolis force. <laughs>
That's such a naughty question. Right. Okay. <laughs> the Coriolis effect. It's a difficult thing to understand, I think. It's to the left. Oh, is it to the right? I always get it wrong. Um, ask that to Brian Hoskins. If you're on um, a um, roundabout in the park... And I throw a ball at you, straight at you, it'll appear to the person on the roundabout, if you like, that the ball follows a curved path. In fact, the ball is travelling straight. Coriolis force is linked to the spinning of the Earth. When you're on a rotating system and you start to move, there's all sorts of different things happen and you tend to be flung off at right, right angles to the way you want to go. And that's what the Coriolis force is always saying, OK, you want to go to that direction, I want you to go that direction. Here we've got an old satellite dish which we painted black. And um, if I put a, a ball bearing on this, just as you expect, it sort of rolls towards the middle. Um, gravity pulls it down towards the middle there. So Next, Professor Hoskins spins the dish to simulate the rotation of the Earth. To witness the effect of this rotation on a travelling object, he has set up a revolving camera above the dish. The ball bearing represents the air moving across the Earth's surface. Clearly, the ball is travelling backwards and forwards. But the revolving camera shows that it's going in circles as well. You see from here, it's almost rotating with the dish. But then when you look on there, what you see relative to this, from the camera that's rotating with it, it's going round and almost in circles, snaking on itself. This simple experiment demonstrates that air is spun around by the... The Coriolis force is created by the spin of the Earth. And on this diagram, you can see the circumference of the Earth at the equator is 40,000 kilometres or thereabouts and 21,600 nautical miles. In the mid latitudes, as shown here, um, the, the distance is shorter, and therefore the surface speed of the Earth is different. So at the equator, the surface speed is about 900 knots, the Earth rotating every 24 hours, or 1670 kph. At the pole, the surface speed is zero. And in the mid, mid latitudes, the surface speed, in this example, 1275 kph. And it's this difference in speed that causes the effect. An object traveling from the equator towards the pole will, in the northern hemisphere, will appear to veer off to the right. And equally, an object traveling from the equator towards the south pole will appear to veer off to its left. So when we're looking at winds, the pressure gradient is uh, one influence and the Coriolis force is another. And the Coriolis force is dependent on a number of factors. One of them is the latitude. So the Coriolis force is greatest um, uh, in the mid latitudes. It's dependent on the speed of rotation of the Earth, which of course doesn't change. Well, we hope it doesn't change. So the Earth rotates every 24 hours. And it also depends on the speed the object is moving. The greater the speed, the greater the Coriolis effect. And so, of course, the greater the pressure gradient, the greater the speed the air moves, the greater the Coriolis effect. Objects are deflected uh, um, to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Effect. An object in motion appears to be deflected from its course as if a force is pulling it sideways. To demonstrate this point, let's imagine a game of catch being played by two people on a merry-go-round that spins like the earth 
but is flat. Without rotation, the ball appears to follow a straight path from thrower to catcher. Imagine the ball is tossed from the center to someone at the edge. With rotation, the ball still travels in a straight line in space, but because the catcher is moving, the ball misses. From the vantage point of the catcher, the ball appears to curve away. The direction of apparent motion is to the right when following the path of the ball. Now the ball is thrown the other way. Because the thrower is moving, the ball has a velocity component to the right. The motion of the ball appears deflected to the right and the ball misses the catcher again. Let's look at a throw across the merry-go-round. Both people move with the merry-go-round. The ball is thrown. Although it flies straight, it appears to be deflected from its original path. Apparent deflection increases as the ball travels farther. In the southern hemisphere, rotation is clockwise when viewed from over the pole. Again, the ball follows a straight course, but its apparent flight path is diverted. This time, the effect is to divert the motion to the left. On Earth, all free moving objects, including masses of air, are subject to the Coriolis effect. In the Northern Hemisphere, objects are diverted to the right as viewed from the direction of original movement. In the Southern Hemisphere, the deflection is to the left. So winds are moving air. They're influenced by the pressure gradient and the Coriolis force, which is an apparent force due to the rotation of the Earth that changes the direction of moving objects, which includes air. The final influence on winds is friction, and that's the resistance to movement, which reduces uh, wind speed. And when we're considering friction, we can consider three layers. First, the laminar boundary layer, which is actually really very thin, one or two millimeters, and the friction there is very strong. But for the purposes of these lectures, this laminar boundary area can be ignored. We have the planetary boundary layer, which is the lower approximately one and a half kilometers of air. And it's the bit that we generally fly in as pilots. And the friction here is very important. And then we have above that, the free atmosphere, which is above about one and a half kilometers, where friction from the surface is actually negligible. It's just about zero. So we're now going to look at the, how the air be, behaves in the free atmosphere. So that's a bit above one and a half kilometers. And we're going to look at how the geostrophic wind is created. And the geostrophic wind is a wind um, uh, created by a balance between the pressure gradient and the Coriolis force. So if we take a look at this diagram, I've drawn high pressure at the bottom, low pressure at the top, and some horizontal lines that represent isobars. If I introduce a parcel of air uh, into that system, you can see that it's going to be influenced by the pressure gradient or pressure gradient force and it will want to move as a result from the high pressure to the low pressure as shown in the diagram here. Because that particle of air or parcel of air is moving it will also be influenced by the Coriolis force which will be 90 degrees to its direction of travel. 
the resultant of these two forces acting on that particle there is it will move off or be deflected to the right as shown in the diagram. When the parcel of air reaches this second position, it's still influenced by the pressure gradient force in the same direction, but the Coriolis force has changed direction slightly because it's going to be acting at 90 degrees to the direction of travel, like that. The result of these two forces acting on the parcel of air will mean that the parcel of air will be further deflected to the right, like that. And uh, again, when the parcel of air has reached this position, guess what? The um, pressure gradient force is still acting directly across the isobars and the Coriolis force is acting down uh, towards the um, bottom of the sheet, like that. And the resultant of that is that the particle of air is further deflected to the right, like that. Um, and again, the pressure gradient force acts up the page and the Coriolis force is beginning to act down the page. And it reaches this stage where the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force are in balance and the particle of air is now traveling parallel with the isobars. And that is called a geostrophic wind. Gradient winds, which you will hear talked about a lot, are basically a geostrophic wind that's been modified uh, to allow for the centrifugal force as air is moving around the curve it will try to throw itself to the outside of the curve um, uh, in real life and so the gradient wind is a more realistic uh, depiction of what the wind is actually doing so now we can see gradient winds uh, and how they behave in the upper atmosphere and in the lower atmosphere so the picture on the right is showing how the air might behave in the planetary boundary layer, so the lower part, and the picture on the right is showing how the wind behaves at altitude. And you can see on the right hand picture, the wind is moving pretty well parallel with the isobars. There's no friction, there's no surface friction to affect it. In the left hand picture, the wind is not deflected from its course quite so much. So the air around the low tends to screw in towards the center of the low, and in a high pressure, it tends to flow slightly out from the center. So I'll give you a little conundrum now and ask you to tell me or we'll figure out which two panels out of these four show how the circulation in the northern hemisphere might work. So the L stands for low pressure and the H stands for high pressure. And I'll give you a moment or two to think about that. And the answer is two. So the air in the northern hemisphere flows anti-clockwise around the low and it flows clockwise around the high. So if we look at a high pressure system for a moment, we can expect the air to want to flow out from the center of the high towards the lower pressure regions on the outside pretty much like that. We know from the Coriolis uh, effect that they will deflect to the right, something like that. And equally, we know with a low pressure region, the air will tend to want to flow in towards the center of the low, 
And we also know that the Coriolis effect will tend to deflect that airflow to the right, like that. And here we can now see the air tendency to flow clockwise around the high pressure and anti-clockwise around the low pressure. We also call high pressure areas anticyclones. So you can have an anticyclonic flow and, or a cyclonic flow. A cyclonic comes from the Greek, I believe, uh, which means the direction in which the Earth spins. In the Northern Hemisphere, anticyclonic is clockwise and anticyclonic is anticlockwise. And in the Southern Hemisphere, anticyclonic is anticlockwise and cyclonic is clockwise. Now we can look at Bayes Ballot's law, which is a very popular exam question. And in the Northern Hemisphere, if you stand with your back to the wind, the low pressure will be on your left as this diagram shows. And it doesn't matter where, um, where you stand in, in that system, it is always the same term, put your back to the wind and the low pressure will be on your left. And this is something you can do at the airfield, stand on the airfield, put your back to the wind um, and on your left will be the low pressure. And if you, um, during the course of the day, repeatedly do that, you'll be able to track the travel of the low pressure system. So summarizing again, in the free atmosphere, the geostrophic wind is the, the uh, wind that is caused by the balance between the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force and making the wind blow parallel with the isobars. The gradient wind is a modification of that, so it's very similar. Um, but more realistic because it accounts for centrifugal force. Now in the boundary layer, the planetary boundary layer, that's the lower part below 1.1.5 kilometers, we need to now start considering friction and friction slows the wind down and it also weakens the Coriolis effect. And this diagram shows us how the high pressure regions now the air is is less deflected in the northern hemisphere. So it's tending to go more towards the low pressure. So the wind backs as we get lower and veers as we get higher. And backing and veering is a term we use when we're describing the changing direction of the wind. And if the wind direction changes in a clockwise direction, we're talking about um, veering. And if it changes in an anti-clockwise direction, we talk about backing. Backing in the opposite direction to the clock, so anti-clockwise. Now we're beginning to pull the flow of air together now. And we know in a high pressure system, the air moves from the center of the high outwards. And of course, if it were to continue to do that, we create a vacuum in the center and people would suffocate. So we need to replace that air and that replacement air comes from above. So the air is steadily descending to replace the air that's flowing out from the center. And that means that in a high pressure system, generally speaking, the air is descending. And as it's descending, it tends to warm, more of that later. And this warming of the air reduces the likelihood of cloud and generally gives fair weather. However, in a low pressure system, the opposite is true. Air is flowing into the center and being forced up the center uh, and 
the rising air in this situation, the air tends to cool, which can lead to cloud forming and generally poorer weather. So high pressure, the air is generally descending and the low pressure, the air is generally ascending. But it's not quite as straightforward as that because it's also rotating as it's climbing and rotating as it's descending. So you can visualize it a little bit like a screw. On the left hand picture here, we have air descending and rotating in a clockwise direction. And in the low pressure on the right hand side, the air is ascending. And so hopefully now we can start pulling this all together. I'd like you to take another look at the map. Uh, ignore the lines and triangles of the warm and cold fronts. We're not going to worry about those right now. Just concentrate on the isobars and their spacing. And I'd like you to consider four things. Where are the areas of high and low pressure first? Which way would you expect the air to be moving and how quickly? Where do you think the clearer skies are likely to be? And where do you think we might be experiencing some rainfall? So first, take a look at this synoptic chart and just spot the highs and the lows. And I'll give you a moment or two to look at that. And there are some highs and lows identified for you. Um, and if you can pick those out, then very well done. We're halfway there. Now, I would like you to consider on the chart where the winds are likely to be from what direction. And you can estimate how strong the winds are likely to be as well. And you might expect to see a pattern like that, generally flowing parallel with the ice bars in a clockwise direction around the highs and an anti-clockwise direction around the lows. So you can see over the UK, we've got basically a westerly airflow. Looking at this as well, we can start considering where the better weather is likely to be. And we know areas of high pressure more likely to be clearer skies uh, where and where the ice bars are tightly packed then the winds are likely to be strong so to the north of the uk you can see there's an area there pretty strong winds um, to the west and out over the atlantic you can see an area of fairly light winds and that's it so thanks very much for listening. I have to give thanks to Julie Ferguson, uh, a doctor of uh, the University of California, who's provided and allowed me to use a huge amount of material. And so thank you very much to her. Um, I've simply pulled it together. And I hope your brains are now not too full. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye for now.